Simon, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you uh, to Peter for uh, the invite. Um, and to Julie for hosting and to the other panelists and to, and to everybody here today. Um, very privileged to be here and to be chatting to everybody about uh, biodiversity. So biodiversity in itself um, seems like a bit of a nebulous thing and perhaps an even a harder one to measure and quantify um, and a little bit more so than a relatively straightforward and simple thing like a sin single element like carbon, which we've been hearing about. So what exactly is biodiversity? And um, so simply put, biodiversity is the variety of all life on Earth. And this is really represented on three different layers. One is the genetic diversity. So that's that diversity within species. Um, and we see that, um, you know, if you just look at uh, the, the domestic dog breed and look at the diversity of the species there um, and the value that that potentially houses and, and holds. So genetic diversity, then there's species diversity, which is a diversity between species. And then finally, we have the ecosystem diversity um, that we find uh, across the planet. So everything from grasslands through to tropical forests and everything in between. So why is this diversity important um, and, and what does it mean? Well, we know from business principles that diversity creates resilience. Um, and resilience is important, especially um, under a, a planet uh, which is being presented with unpredictable and rapidly changing climates. But what does that mean for us as global citizens and for the business community and investor community at large? And why is it important? Well, if we look at the um, World Economic Forum's latest risk, latest risk reports, um, we'll see that 50% of the world's GDP relies on nature. And this has taken quite a bit to quantify and to think about, but when you think about, for example, all of the crops, um, you know, food security, global nutrition, so the crop diversity through to the thousands of pollinator species that we rely exclusively on. You can also think of all the ecosystem services like soil regeneration, water capture and purification. Um, you know, if you look at it, three quarters of all global jobs are, are water dependent. So additionally to this, our health is insured uh, through uh, ecosystem services. So if you think about the pharmaceutical industry, um, which is underpinned by nature, you know, over 25% of all of our modern drugs to date um, originated from the rainforests and over 70% of all cancer drugs have been inspired or sourced from, from nature. So if we look at that in recent times, um, for example, two plants from Madagascar were recently found that contribute to an 85% increase uh, in the likelihood of remission for children with leukemia. And another plant has been found to help creating novel antibiotics to combat uh, antibiotic resistant diseases. Yet at the same time, Madagascar has cut down over 25% of its trees in the last 20 years. And so 60% of its tree species now are facing extinction. Um, however, during that period of time in the last 20 years, we've also discovered over 650 new species um, and incredibly 41 of those are mammal species uh, just on that island. So with that rate of loss, but with that rate of, of discovery, we can't even imagine how many species have been completely lost to science and are yet to be discovered there. And every single time we lose a species, we essentially are losing our opportunities for us. And that's really what our mission is at Value for Nature, is to make sure that we don't miss out on long-term global opportunities for the sake of short-term gains. So Value Nature is looking to create a new nature-based commodity process to accelerate the protection of nature beyond the carbon additionalities, which is what Keegan was talking about earlier. Unfortunately, many people have dissociated the fact that carbon stocks in forests and the wilderness areas are represented and actually maintained by biodiversity. So plants above and below ground biomass is the very carbon that we are trying to secure, but the healthy wildlife and insect communities maintain that diversity and promote plant and soil carbon sequestration and storage. As we just heard from Keegan just now, the current carbon credit market is inadequate to meet our climate targets 
and can often take two, three years, sometimes even four years to realize the credits um, for an area. And with the rate of loss that we're encountering, that's unfortunately just a little bit too slow. And so we need to rethink about these things. Also within the additionality, create some perverse incentives and the lack of the global support for standing stocks of protected forests and conservation landscapes often means that communities and governments aren't rewarded for their continued efforts to protect biodiversity and all of that carbon that's contained within that. So a good example of this is the carbon landscape, um, sorry, is the conservation landscape in Tanzania. So Tanzania is looking to add an extra 17 million people by the year 2030. However, it's got over 40% of its total area dedicated to conservation, which is a huge achievement for a developing country. This is a, these air, landscapes have generally um, created revenue through photographic tourism or trophy hunting. However, with the impacts of COVID on international travel and the banning of trophy, trophy imports into many Western nations, means that there's a desperate need to rethink how we generate revenue for these areas. However, for the Tanzanian government to best optimize returns for the, from the carbon industry currently, they would be best to declare all of these reserves for logging or charcoal production, following which they could then create massive additionalities from the carbon revenues. And that's a perverse incentive that's associated with this. So looking at it another way, it's essentially paying the bank robbers to not rob the banks while the model citizens are left on the side watching and contributing to the economy. So we need to rethink about how these unprotected conservation landscapes um, represent a massive opportunity. And you know, within the next five years, um, we could potentially access over 8 million hectares of similar wildlife concessions within Southern and East Africa with just one conservation land management partner, Port Conserve Global. These are landscapes greater than the area of, of Lake Superior and would include over 8 million tons of carbon stocks. And how would we propose going about this? Well, we've identified the right mix of science-based biodiversity metrics, technology and data systems to create a proof of existence to ensure fully trustable, traceable and transparent biodiversity tokens can be um, developed on a blockchain so that we can drive the investment and protection into these landscapes through special purpose vehicles. So a token would represent the investment needed for the acquisition and protection of these landscapes for a decade. And token holders would have the first right of, to repurchase the future tokens um, for the next round. So each token is linked to a conservation landscape's biodiversity score. And how do we go about the scoring system and how do we think about it? Well, what we're doing is we're assessing a project site and seeing how it is compared to a pristine version of the same habitat. So a degraded project site has a potential to recover as it moves towards a more pristine state so that their status of fauna and flora increases. And then this will increase the biodiversity score of the site from each year. This incentivizes the custodians to invest the revenue to recover and protect this system while also increasing the value of these tokens. So we'll use satellite imagery to assess the vegetation remotely and quickly and, and cheaply. And for the wildlife, we'll record um, the difference in the abundance of these species using state-of-the-art bioacoustic saturation index, which is essentially little mini recorders that we deploy across um, an environment and we can listen in and hear what's there. You think of a rich environment, it's got rich sounds, birds calling, insects, frogs calling, and we can actually measure that and compare it from one area to another and determine the status of the biodiversity in that landscape. And we'll also deploy camera traps to get an idea of the large mammal component um, which aren't as noisy as some of those other taxa that I just um, referred to. So then when we look at our score um, that we've devised, we take into account the status of the flora and the fauna. And for each of these, we've also created a weighting factor. And from a plant perspective, the value is attributed to the potential of the contribution of a landscape to contribute to carbon sequestration and storage. And that's indicated by the above ground plant biomass. And this can be measured using satellite imagery. Um, Keegan mentioned some of these approaches earlier. And the, the satellite imagery really um, 
has kind of opened up things from an assessment perspective um, and we, we don't actually need teams on the ground anymore we can do this all, all remotely so we'll use this to determine the tonnage of carbon stocks per hectare and use that as a weighting factor for the flora component and then on the fauna on the wildlife side of things the international union for the conservation of nature has developed a star metric which is essentially a species from a species conservation perspective and is based on the area of habitat available to threaten and endangered bird mammals and amphibians in a landscape and this uh, metric is already available and, and is easily downloaded and we'll use that as a weighting factor um, on our faunal side of things so ultimately the flora score and the fauna score will be equally weighted to create our final value nature score for a project site across all of these we'll have our our data and we'll use a distributed ledger process of creating proofs and validations for each a uh, piece of the data that will be created and these data streams will be hashed on a distributed ledger technology uh, to issue the tokens and this will mitigate the double accounting pro uh, problem that is often associated uh, in the carbon space while also providing transparency and traceability we've settled on the hedera hash graph due to their zero carbon footprint and because of the new guardian network which is aligned with the interwork alliance um, effort to standardize the tokenization of ecological credits so simply put we've got our biodiversity custodians which are the government the community and the land managers that you see here and they're all responsible for the conservation landscape and we'll create a special purpose venture um, that token holders can get involved with provide, providing the capital for the management um, and the long-term um, acquisition of, of these landscapes the conservation landscape will have ecosystem services that will come out of it and so we can um, value those in the form of carbon credits, biodiversity gains, and in the future biodiversity credits. And those will create revenue into the special purpose venture. And those profit shares will be sent back to the biodiversity custodians, which will include the investors and the token holders. As I've already mentioned, these conservation landscapes are readily available. And one of our land management partners has already identified and is working to securing millions of hectares for investment through multiple decade long lease um, agreements. So we're working to create that investment portal to assist them and other land partners globally to engage with investors and ensure that we don't lose this massive opportunity to create investments that, ma that matter. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, a couple of questions have, have come in. First of all, where are you in your development of the company, um, Value Nature? So we're at um, kind of the seed, seed stage of things. We're just get, getting things going. Um, we're working with our partner. We've identified the landscapes. We've identified the metrics. We've got those all together. Um, so the next step this year is to actually deploy our um, assessment techniques. Um, and develop our first tokens, hopefully by the end of the year. Do you have any sense of what uh, the value or cost of those tokens will be yet? So we're looking at um, aligning the, the cost of the tokens with the cost of the, the management and the operating expenses for the landscapes, as well as including a share for the community custodians and the government custodians. So we're looking at, um, you know, current management costs um, will vary from one area to, to the next, but we're gonna try and standardize that across, across the area. But tokens will be linked directly to very specific project sites. Um, so they won't be necessarily equal across an area, but we're looking at anywhere from say $5 per hectare, um, you know, they, they represent a hectare. So $5 per hectare on an annual basis for the operating expenses. And then we'll have to bring in the community um, share, the government share on that. So we'll probably work upwards of around $10 um, per token on an annual basis. So over the 10 year period, about $100 for a token, um, which represents that hectare of landscape. Great, thank you. Question came in about poachers. Um, how are you dealing with that? So that investment um, that's been made goes directly down onto the ground to the land management partners who are the experts in terms of, of managing these landscapes and, and mitigating issues like poaching. Um, and that's poaching of wildlife, poaching of, of trees as well um, is, is a big problem in a lot of these landscapes. Um, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, conservation is really about job creation and job development. Um, so we really see 
Um, you know, when we talk about operating expenses, that's really got to do with employing people on the ground as field rangers, as biological uh, monitors, uh, people in the uh, ecotourism industry and the like, um, and then engaging with those communities that ultimately are the custodians of these landscapes. And so the more jobs that we can develop and, and value that we can add to these landscapes and direct financial returns to these community custodians, um, we'll be able to start seeing proper reductions in poaching um, uh, in, in these areas, because at the end of the day, it's all just about development. Mm. It is a, a complicated task. Um, Keegan actually sent a question about uh, biodiversity crediting. Um, are there other approaches uh, that in this active space? Um, there's, there's none current. There's a, there's a number of biodiversity offsets that, that exist that are formulated um, where it's a one for one um, as an offsetting mechanism that exists. So, you know, if you're going to build a new shopping mall on a wetland over here, you need to go and protect a wetland over there type of thing. Um, so those, those are fairly established and a little bit more regulated. What we're trying to do is actually move beyond that and move beyond the additionality component and create an investment mechanism that allows people to actually get behind these areas and invest into these areas and benefit from what might come from that. So if there are biodiversity gains made in a landscape, that token will house those gains because its score will change over time. So perhaps my token in year one I purchased has a score of 60. So it's 60% kind of near to pristine and maybe it moves to 90% by the end of the 10 year period. We've made a 30% gain there and we could mint biodiversity credits from that that could be used as offsets elsewhere. Um, and or the um, biodiversity token holder could offset those against their own books um, or they could be sold and they could benefit from it. At the same time, that investment vehicle as well as a biodiversity token holder, there could be carbon gains that are made and we can go and do proper carbon assessments and look at it and create carbon credits. And again, those can be sold and or offset by the token holders. And if there's a sale, then there's revenue generated, which goes back to the SPV and token holders gain, gain, get gains as well as the community and the government um, custodians. I'm getting a thumbs up from Keegan, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we only um, have a, a bit of time left, but a question came in about returning value to farmers and custodians. How does Value Nature do that? So what, what's nice about working within a, a blockchain space and in the token space is that we can actually develop e-wallets directly um, for the custodians on the ground. So we could apportion a percentage of token sales directly to those groups um, or almost immediately as a token is created, they would have the e-wallets and that, that could be distributed. I um, in the future, we're thinking of, um, you know, for example, in the African space, a lot of people um, send money using uh, e-cash on, on cell phone technology, for example. Um, so we envision a future where token holders and or future trading of token holders that there's royalty shares that goes back to those um, listed biodiversity custodians within the area, and they could actually get um, monetization uh, directly into their e-wallets and we can track and trade that um, using the token system. So step one though, is to have strong conservation partners on the ground that are managing these areas that are engaged with the government, engaged with the communities, and know exactly who those custodians are and who the beneficiary, beneficiaries are. Um, and again, through our whole process to be able to make that. Um, trustable, traceable, and transparent. Wow, it's a really impressive. Um, Simon, you have a couple of other uh, questions. If, uh, if you can address them in the Q&A, that would be fantastic. We'll do um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much.